May I now call on the first speaker of the proposition to begin today's debate? I want you to imagine a situation that you will likely face, and that many people in this room will likely face. You are in your old age, and you will die. You will likely die in agony on life support, with your mind almost being destroyed by anesthetics. In this situation, we think that it's entirely reasonable that you should be allowed to choose how to end your life, the terms in which you do so. Because we stand for your dignity, and the lives of everyone who wants to end their life we're very proud to propose. In this speech, I'm going to be setting up the framing of the round and then presenting our first two substantive arguments. First, that the right to die is a personal choice that shouldn't be interfered with. And second, that individuals have a right to a dignified death. But first, some framing. When we consider what's a right, we think that it's a right if it meets two standards. First, if it doesn't interfere with the rights of others. For instance, you don't have a right to murder. And second, if it's made rational. Now, in terms of a right to die, we think that all individuals should support a right for anyone to end their life how they choose. And we think the state should support it through means like providing counseling to those who wish to end their lives. And if it's determined that they are a rational actor and still want to die, we'll allow these individuals to die in whatever way they choose. The burden of proposition in today's round is to show that the right to die is consistent with an individual's right to free choice and control over their own lives. With that, I want to present our first substantive argument about how this is a personal choice that shouldn't be interfered with. First, we think that this is a, absolutely something that you should be allowed to choose. Now, we think that rights are converse. Right now, the government certainly supports your right to life through things like police services. But we think that the converse of the right to life is also the right to death. And we think that this is clearly established over all other rights. Sir. For instance, no thanks, you have a right to free speech, but you also have a right to choose when you exercise it and when not to exercise it. And if anything, the right to life is the most personal right you could exercise. If you don't have the right to life, you can't possibly control any other element of your agency. We think that your life is the most personal thing possible. It is far more personal than your speech it is far more personal than any other action you could possibly exercise. And because of this, we think that individuals should have an absolute right over how that, what they do with their lives, how they choose to conduct it, and how they choose to end it. But we also think that you have a right to how you maintain your dignity and your identity. First of all, we think that if a condition would change who you are fundamentally, we think that you have a right to die who you want, as who you want to be. For instance, if a condition would put you through so much pain, so much mental anguish, that it would fundamentally change the nature of your character and your identity, we think that you have a right to end your life before you get to that point. This is also very clear in the instance of diseases, for instance, like Alzheimer's, which will literally destroy your mental capacity to be who you are. We don't think that anyone should be forced to live out the life, remember, not being able to remember who their loved ones are. We think that that's absolutely horrible and individuals who are in this position should be allowed to choose how they die. We think that your life is something absolute. No other person should have claim over it. It is absolutely yours to do it as you wish. We recognize that in some instances, individuals might be persuaded not to take their lives, but if they choose to do so, we think the government should not interfere with it at all. Now, I want to present our second argument about how individuals have a right to a dignified death. Now, we think that in many instances, you will go through massive suffering if you're allowed to die naturally. So for instance, most old people die from organ failure and sepsis. Literally, waste matter filling up your veins, putting you through immense agony. This is a situation that nobody in this room wants to confront. And if you were in that amount of pain, we think that you would make the rational choice to end your life. Now, we also think that you should find comfort in the type of death you want, right? Because we think that nobody should want or should be forced to end their life one moment on feeding tubes in agony. We think that you should be allowed to take your life with the means that you choose for yourself. 
Yes. After investing so many resources in order to enhance the potential of people, to bring social utility to the society, why should the state recognize this as a right for individual in contradiction with that everything else that he has done so far? So your argument is that because these people have grown up, because the state has invested resources in them, that they should keep them in artificial suffering for years at a time, even when these people themselves recognize that they no longer can provide utility to society. It's absolutely insane to suggest that these people should not have the right to make their own decisions. We think that if you stand for this, you could literally subvert every single individual right if it was in the interest of the state. That's entirely unjust. Now, we think that on side opposition, the state is forcing these people to go through incredible pain, right? Because these people are often going go through the most intense mental anguish of their lives, most intense physical anguish. And on their side of the house, they would say, we should keep these people alive. We should force them, prevent them literally, from taking their own lives. We should subvert their own individual will in recognition of a greater goal. We think that's absurd because your right to life is intensely personal, and so is your right to die. Yes, sir. Sir, your burden today is to support right to die, not assisted suicide. What you have done so far is supporting just assisted suicide. Well, we think that individuals should also be able to commit suicide as long as they're rational actors, right? So for instance, if someone is standing on a bridge, we think that, they should, that individuals around them should try and convince them not to jump off, because they don't know if they're a rational actor or if they've been coerced to do that. But we think that in instances where you can prove that these individuals are rational actors and they have not been coerced, we think that they should absolutely be allowed to end their lives. Now second, under this, we also think that individuals have a right to not put their families through suffering. So for instance, any elderly person doesn't want to see the tears of their grandchildren every single day for two years, putting them through intense agony. We think that it's an entirely personal choice on the part of these individuals not to put their family through suffering. Now, recognize this, and now opposition might try and say, Sorry. well, you're being, making a utilitarian calculus, no thank you, about the suffering of their families. No, we recognize that if individuals make this calculus, we think that we should support their right to do so. So, we think that there are many reasons why individuals would want a right to a dignified death, and we think that we can facilitate this. We can have a frank discussion with them about how they choose to die. We can allow them the ability to choose how they die instead of forcing them to commit in, abs in private conditions that are absolutely inhumane. Now, I want to be extremely clear. Your right to die is just as important as any other right. Your right to free speech is generally recognized as absolute unless it interferes with the rights of others. And in the case of the right to die, it couldn't possibly be the case that it interferes with the rights of others because your life is not tied to anyone else. It is entirely within your domain, it is entirely up to your choice. On side proposition, we protect the ability of the individual to make rational decisions about how they choose to live their life and how they choose to end them. We support the dignity of individuals who are going through trauma, who are going through intense anguish, and we don't think that the state should keep them on life support until they end their lives in agony. Because we support the right to die as an absolute right, we are very proud to propose. May I now call on the first speaker of the opposition to give it me. Before anything, let's clarify something. This motion today was not only about assisted suicide. This motion today talked about not only about the context in which you have sick people which are on the bed of dying and should have the right to die. It also talked about individuals who are not necessarily in a bad medical situation, who are not necessarily having any pragmatic issues which might entitle, by the reasoning of the government, 
decision to die and should be allowed to die. Now, what the government believes here today is that a person in the moment in which he lost, he or she lost everything in his life, everything he could have cared for, and that moment that person is capable to look at the future perspective and capable to take a rational decision. Because we believe that no, Mr. Speaker, individuals who are going through suffering, who have gone through a lot of things, cannot look toward the future perspective. Thus, they cannot take a rational choice. This doesn't mean that they are crazy. This doesn't mean that they are insane. It just means that people are not rational beings, and they cannot take decisions in moments of crisis. Now, what does the government have to prove to us? Now, first of all, why are people entitled to it? Second of all, why is it the duty of governments to offer the context for people to commit suicide? A thing which they did not take a tackle at all. They did not prove the duty of governments to give us this right being given. No, thank you. Third of all, they should bring us clear benefits of the lever of the individual when this is happening. But Mr. Speaker, a few points of rebuttal about personal choices they have to use. But I have told us that, you know, it's like free speech. I can choose right now not to talk, and then I can choose to talk, and I can choose when I want to have a free speech. That's the point. You can choose when you want to leave, but if you chose at one point not to leave, then you cannot say, well, now I want to leave. That's the problem. What you are expecting is that for people who have chosen not to leave, they can afterwards if they think, well, this was not what I would have wanted, I want to leave again, they're going to be able to do that. No, they cannot take the decision again, they cannot take it back. Second, they have told us that your dignity is going to be a factor, and all of these things. But of course, this analysis does not stand up when we're looking at the context in which these people are. Like right now, you're on your on your analysis, on your cost benefit analysis, you might think that your dignity, which is the fact that it is worth dying. But the problem is, these individuals are put in a context in which you're not rational. Of course, that in the moment in which you're told that you have two more uh, two, two more hours to, to leave, you're not going to be that likely to choose to leave. Of course, that in the moment in which your child, which you love a lot, is uh, has died, you're not so willing to leave anymore. But the question is. If you were not in this context, and if you were to look at the person which was in the really same context as you, would you be able as an individual to say that? And we believe that for some people that answer could be yes, for some people that answer could be no. The problem is that in the moment in which you're put in such a context, most of the time the answer which you're going to give is yes, because you cannot see a future perspective, because in that moment your choices are not free choices. But now my own constructive action. And what am I going to prove to you? Now, first of all, what I will be doing is that I will be proving to you why this doesn't fulfill the criteria as to be a right. And then my colleague is going to talk to you about the implication which this right has on the broader society and about why it is not a right. Now, what am I going to do in the, uh, before that? Yes, you seem to disagree. Why should the government ever be allowed to deny people the right to choose and control the most fundamental part of their existence? I'm getting there in my construction. Now, what we're saying is that in the moment in which we are looking at this right, we have to look first if we can control it. Second, if we give right, uh, if this is if this right in particular maximizes the life of individuals, third of all, if it stops debate, and fourth of all, if it contradicts other rights. And when we're talking about threat, as I have told you, when we when people are put in this very precarious context, where they have gone through a lot of things, their choices as not a rush. There's the probability to take a choice which does not represent what they would have usually wanted to take is quite high. Now, first of all, I have shown you why there is a high probability for people to take a choice which does not represent them in general. Now, let's look at the, what are the implications if they take this choice which does not represent them. They die and they cannot live again. It's not like free speech. Now, the problem is that in the moment in which individuals have this high probability to take rights which does not represent them, in the moment in which they take this right, there is no coming back. There could be a coming back when you said something which you didn't mean. You could apologize for that. You could say you didn't mean that. But when you die, you cannot take it back. Now think about, first of all, the burden which is put on people. Now second of all, think, of, think about the responsibility of the state, about how the state somehow, in the context in which he's perfectly aware of the fact that there is a threat in this matter, 
high probability for people to take the decision or it does not represent them, and big, huge harms which would come if they take this decision. But how the state, knowing that there is this threat which it cannot prevent and control, having to assure it? We believe that fundamentally, that is the problem. The state should not support this right. The state should not support the right of the people to die when they know that the decision which they are going to take is not what they would have probably taken. Yes. So how can the state possibly prevent this? That is the problem. The state could not possibly prevent this, and the state should not allow this right to exist. Now, when we're talking about is this battering the lives of individuals, what do we have to say in this match? In general, we believe that the only duty which the state has is to batter the lives of individuals and of in the, in the broader society. This is why we have right to free speech. This, way, this is why in Canada, for instance, we have right of medical care, which is imposed by the state, and all over the world. But the problem in this regard is that in the moment in which you are taking such a policy, this is not bettering the lives of individuals. Pragmatically speaking, it is not measuring the lives of individuals because they die. They could come with a floppy analysis about how in general people are feeling good and they are feeling hopeless, but I think that I have proven to you why that is a biased decision which they would take and it But more than this, what we have to say in general is that what is happening in the moment in which the state has to take a decision is that it takes decision and gives rights for the lifetime. It is looking at the lifetime of individuals. It is measuring the lifetime of individuals. And it's not battering the possibility of individuals to die when they want. What the state is also doing is that when people are in great threat of dying, it is battering their context to die. It is making it a more pleasurable context. People who have cancer can go to clinics for people with terminal diseases. And they can get certain medicines which ease their pain and all of these things. But the state does not have to kill these people if they want to. No, more than what we believe in this matter, which, which is that we stop debate. When we call something a right, it means that we cannot discuss it. We cannot discuss nowadays that right of free speech probably should not exist for all individuals. Probably right of free speech is not at work. When you call it a right, it becomes absolute. Uh, absolute. absolute. Now, fourth of all, when it contradicts other rights, the problem with that is that in the moment in which you have the right to leave, we believe that there is a right which you have. You, rights are not yours to take away, are yours to use. In the moment in which you have the right to die, you're contradicting the right of life, because in that moment, you are letting individuals take their own rights away, which we believe fundamentally is not something which we allow. Why don't, for instance, we don't allow individuals to sell their rights or to give their rights away. This is why we don't allow slavery. For instance, we don't allow individuals to give their rights just because that could make money. We don't allow individuals to sell their rights away. Now, Mr. Speaker, Tim Romania here today has had a huger understanding of the motion. But not talking only about assisted suicide as the government has done, and talking about the right of dying in itself. Now, we believe that what we have proven to you today is that it does not fulfill the criteria to be a right, and that the case of the government in this, in this case does not stand up. So, for all these reasons, we back with you to approach. that gets up here and says that your rights are not yours to use, that your rights do not belong to you. And that is the fundamental clash within this round. Because what we believe is that the entire purpose of a right is to guarantee something to a person. That the point of a right is to provide for the person, to provide for their life, and to provide for their happiness. And that any time you destroy someone's dignity, destroy their identity, and destroy their happiness in the name of rights, then you are clearly in the territory of wrongs. And as such, we are proud to propose. In this speech, I'll begin by clearing up some of the framing, then look at what team opposition told you, look, go over our first two points, and then present our third substantive argument, which is that this promotes better discussion and understanding of death and suicide. But let us begin on the framing. So they get up here and say that we can't just talk about assisted suicide. And what I say is our arguments apply to any and all time which someone decides to take their life. 
We argue that it's principally justified because your life is your own control. And we also argue that things like intense suffering aren't just limited to, say, terminal illness. We think that if you're undergoing intense psychological suffering, it's an incurable condition, then our arguments absolutely apply to that as well. We think it's unfair of them to pretend that we're only talking about physician-assisted suicide. So now let's move on to what we heard from opposition. Essentially, they provide to you four reasons why this shouldn't be right. So let's go through all four of them. Firstly, they argue that it's impossible because you can't control the use of this right and because it's irreversible. The first thing we tell you is that irreversibility doesn't matter on a right. For instance, if I right now decide that for the rest of my life, I will never speak again. I have given up my right to free speech for the rest of my life, but that's Sorry. still my right, right? It's still an individual choice. So irreversibility doesn't change the nature of an individual's decision. It's still their free choice. Then they argue that this is bad because individuals are always irrational in these circumstances. The first thing we tell you is that Sir. if people are suffering from an actual medical condition, like schizophrenia or some other psychological condition that prevents them from making this decision, then of course you would offer them counseling rather than offering them assisted suicide. That's not part of our model to Sir. kill crazy people. What we're saying is that when individuals make this decision rationally, then it should happen. I would like to point out a huge problem in their case, which is essentially they say, because people are undergoing immense pain, that makes it an irrational decision. And we have to ask what they would want if they weren't under this immense pain. But that makes no sense. Because the only reason they make this decision is because they're under intense pain. You're denying the entire point why we're having this debate. You can't get up here and say, the fact that they're suffering means they can't make this decision. That's why they make this decision. Furthermore, they argue, it's the duty of the state to maximize an individual's life. What we challenge you is, who is the Sir. state to decide for the individual what counts as a good life? If an individual, the only one who knows what it's like to be them, decides that they wish to end their life, who is the state to contradict them? The state does not understand what it's like to have Alzheimer's. The state does not understand what it is like to be in so much pain and so much agony that you would rather have it all stop. The state does not understand, and as such, the state has no right to take that decision away from the only person who does understand you, and that is you. But I hear dissent. Please, explain us one in the, once in this debate why your analysis stands in another scenario if you only talk about the pain that those individuals are exposed to. If we take away pain, you still allow suicide to be a right, a fundamental right for right place. Okay, so the essential premise of our case is anytime someone wants to commit suicide, they're probably in pain. What we're arguing is that perfectly healthy people living perfect lives don't commit suicide because they're so happy. We think anytime someone wants to end their life, it's because something about that life is hurtful or painful to them. We think that's a perfectly reasonable assumption to have this debate on. Then they move on and say, well, calling it a right ends debate. They never explain how, they never explain why this matters. And we say, furthermore, we debate rights all the time. That's what we're doing right now. Finally, they say that this contradicts other people's rights. But we tell you that fundamentally it cannot, because your right to life fundamentally belongs to you. They say that we don't have slavery because that's giving up your right to freedom. The reason we don't have slavery is because one person taking away the rights of another person, taking away freedom. But if you want to, say, work for free, that's not slavery. If you want to give up your right to life, your control over your own life, then you are exercising your right to life, not giving it up. Now moving to our own points. I've already addressed all the actual responses they've made, so let's look at what we tell them. What we tell you is that an individual has the right to choose how they spend their life. What we tell you Sir. is that when a firefighter sacrifices their life to save a stranger, to save them from suffering, we call them a hero. If someone wants to give up their life to end the suffering and pain of their family, why should we call them anything else? We believe that individuals have the right to die on their own terms, to determine their identity, and to spend their life in the way that they choose. And we think we recognize this right all the time for other people in society, but somehow don't recognize it for every individual on a principled level. Then our second argument we tell you is that when these individuals are undergoing intense suffering, that's completely contradictory to claim that you are maximizing the welfare of the citizen while forcing people to engage in this horrendous suffering in order to prove just how much you care about their welfare. We think that's completely contradictory. If you truly care about the citizen, let them control their life. Let them dictate the terms in which they live, and let them decide when it's too much and when they want to end the suffering. Don't let the state decide, because the state cannot possibly know. Now for our third substantive argument, which is that this helps promote better discourse and understanding of death. What we say is that right now, the way that we approach death and the way that we approach citizens who wish to end their own life is fundamentally flawed because we are unwilling to accept that suicide is ever an option. These people who wish to end their life can never have a real conversation because the conversation is over before it starts. The other person will always say, don't do it, keep living, there's so much more, but they never truly listen. In any conversation about suicide, 
the person who isn't contemplating suicide has already made up their mind. They've already decided that the objective of the conversation is to change this person's mind. And what that means is they're never listening. We think that when suicide is a real possibility, when individuals have the right to end their life, then people will finally take them seriously. People will finally listen to the reasons why they feel this way, and that in many circumstances, Sir. this may actually prevent suicides, because people are able to have a frank conversation, people are able to have an honest interchange, and they don't feel abandoned, marginalized, and ignored, which is what many people who contemplate taking their life nowadays feel every day. We think that the best solution to anguish is someone understanding it, not someone denying that it's important, which is fundamentally what happens when people are aren't willing to recognize the possibility of suicide in the second place. Second of all, we think that this has a very practical influence on the way we think about death. We think right now we have a major problem with suicide, which is that it's mystified and romanticized. And that for many, especially young people who commit suicide, this is one of the driving psychological factors. Because we're so afraid to talk about suicide, because we're so afraid to recognize that it's a real thing, it becomes very mysticized and romanticized in the minds of people who are contemplating. They don't think about suicide as real. They don't think about the practical consequences of it. They simply think of this romantic image of jumping off a bridge or of ending their life. We think that when we allow suicide as a real, practical option, as something that people have the right to choose to do, you lead to a much more honest and better conversation, where you ask people the reasons why, where you talk through the issues, and if they truly have decided that the only source for their happiness or the happiness of their loved ones is to end their own life, that we listen to them, that we facilitate them, and that we respect them. Not that we just assert, oh, well, we know better. Fundamentally, what we believe is that rights are about the individual. We do not think the opposition has ever met their burden of proving why the government has the justification to take away this right, and we think we have clearly met the proposition burden, that this is an extension of the right to control your life, the right to control your happiness, and the right to choose how you live and how you die. And that is why we propose. when they are in family relation. Their second speaker comes in and says that our analysis applies to every single kind of suicide because even if it's not physically, you might feel mental pain and this might, might guide your reasoning in order to take away your own life. Which one of them is right and what is for today is the stance of the proposition. We believe that those two principles indeed contradict themselves. In order to define pain, we need a lot of accuracy and we believe that this point, by the end of my speech, will fall on other side of your house. But before introducing this to you this point, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in my speech. First of all, rebuttaling the, 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 the points of Team USA, then reinforce my first speech. And lastly, I'm going to tell you how the burden of the state is not to create the context in order to tell people that you try to maximize your possibilities of life in order now to maximize your potentiality to die. And I'm going to show you why this doesn't stand under the burden of the state. But before that, let's analyze a little bit which was the assumption of Team USA. First of all, their entire case falls if we manage to prove by the end of this debate that this right precisely and guaranteeing this right by the state does not stand under the right of choice that we've granted to individuals, right? How am I going to do this? 
First of all, we say that the state should not impose rights to our, which are exposed to vulnerability, right? If we don't have the possibility to control the outcome of a right, if we don't have the possibility to know what these rights imply, if we consider death as something unknown that nobody actually knows something about, we don't consider that it is in the interest of the state to encourage people to research for the unknown without having any possibility of giving them the possibility to return back to what they uh, to this decision, to change their mind, so on and so forth. But lastly, we believe that in order for a choice to be truly valuable, we have to analyze if that person makes the choice entirely, and we should analyze the factor of a choice in this context, context precisely. We believe that we're creating a coercing context for individuals, where because they know that they have the right to escape the system so, so easily, because they know that they were granted the life to end their, uh, they were granted the, uh, the right to end their life whenever they take, we're going to create a coercing system for them, right? They won't even fight anymore. Even if in another scenario they would want to fight for their family, they would want to fight for their dignity, in the context in which we are providing them with this right, we're discouraging individuals to value life, and we're putting ourselves contradictory with the principles that we have established for ourselves. But also, we believe that we're creating escaping, becoming more comfortable becoming more comfortable for these individuals, even if they wouldn't have considered this in the first place, we're creating another option that they wouldn't even take into consideration by looking on this, on this equation, objectively speaking, right? If we're talking about people who are feeling pain, we're also talking about people who are putting emotions beyond generation, right? So if you want to talk about the system, suicide, or if you want to talk about people that go to depression, there are entire criteria on how are we going to define the right, uh, right granted on somebody to suicide, <coughs> dramatically. Why? Because you are not able to quantify the ratio of, the, of one individual. Why? Because you don't have the possibility to specify when a pain is much more uh, much more likely, the one that we want to stand for, or in a pain falls under the assumption of being irrational. We don't think that we have this criteria when the right does not give us the possibility to set staff criteria in order for this to, uh, to, to say when the right is being oppressed, when the, we're acting against one's right, we don't believe that we should ever pass it, right? Now, talking about their extension, about better understanding people, and then reaching a, a level of communication that it wasn't touched before. First of all, it is an assumption to say that you're in, uh, going to encourage people to be more likely to agree with your decision to suicide just because you make it a right, right? We have freedom of speech and we still have a lot of individuals who just cannot handle that people express their religion views in public. It's not like when you make something a right, you're either forcing people to listen to your to, to listen to your justification better than they will listen before. And secondly, we say that we can still have those discussions when it comes to the status quo, and we don't see a precise mechanism when this is going to change when we're making you a right. We're not uniform, you're, you're not making uniform decisions, opinions, and the ability of, of people Point to empathy me. in the moment mm -hmm. when we're taking this policy uh, closer. If you think coercion is so wrong, then why are you advocating for the state to force people to keep living when they have decided that they no longer wish to? Yeah, I'm going to move to precisely my extension. Thank you for your opinion. Now, let's see a little bit how do people react and why the state has the, has, it's not in the burden of the state and in the duty of the state to encourage such a policy. Right. We grant rights in order for the functionality of our society to increase, not to decrease. In the moment when you are part as an individual from the society, you give up to some of your rights in order to maximize the utility of society. For your entire life, you've been, you've been granted benefits by the society. You've been granted welfare, you've been granted, uh, granted the possibility of enriching perspectives. The state invested a lot of money, energy, and resources in your development. And in the moment when you're, when you're born, Realistically speaking, you not only have the ability to enrich yourself by using these rights, you also have the, have, have the obligation to give something back to society and actively contribute. Right? Right. But also, we say that it, it was establishing the burden of a state when it was first created to enrich the possibility of human beings to, to reach a social utility and the functionality of the state that we today encourage. Right? We say that the, the state should not favorize the creation of this environment. Let's imagine a world in which that will become a right, right? We will have a lot of clinics and environment in which this will be will be possible to be made. We will have a lot of doctors that will have to feel like aggressors in the moment in which they want to opt out on of the system that we're not where they are, they don't feel like they fulfill it. And their entire analysis on how you're going to better dialogue, how you're going to better connections between people will fall apart. Why? Because the people that will feel like they are strongly against the right that the state already imposed will be vulnerable 
because they won't have the possibility to opt out without being considered aggressors of fundamental rights that we have established for ourselves. This is how you're actually inhibiting the possibility of people to act as full individuals, the possibility of people or in order to, to pass their ideas through, and the possibility of people to keep themselves untouched by, by the policies that governments right, right? We believe that it's not in the burden of the state to create an environment that kills potential and future perspectives. But moreover, it's not in the duty of the state to put somebody in a position of vulnerability and actually takes advantage of the vulnerability of that individual. By creating a coercing context in which death becomes such a viable, viable option, we believe that the state takes away your possibility to choose, but moreover, minimizes your ability to choose. Your choice becomes less important in the eyes of the state because you're coerced by the context to take a decision that in that specific moment you consider as being more comfortable. This is why we're even diminishing the right of individual to choose if it falls under the paradigm of choosing, a context in which you cannot define ration, but moreover, a context in which you're much rather coerced to take a decision rather than a context in which the decision can be a, a, a result of a cost and a benefit analysis. But moreover, we have upholding the principle of my right ends when your right begins, right? We believe that you're affecting a lot of people in the moment when you take this decision and you cannot ask for their consent, right? When the right is becoming so universal, the value of consent loses a lot of trust while analyzing how rights actually look like after you pass the constitution. And if it intervenes in the right of others, if it affects them emotionally, if it affects their well-being as individuals, if it makes them less of a performative individual in society, when somebody of my own family decides to take, to take his, his life away, we believe that we're affecting society, even if, if on, a, on a larger scale, by affecting the utility of individuals, by affecting their functionality when it comes to society, and by affecting, therefore, their emotional, with their emotional feelings when it comes to how they interact with the others. Because we're not encouraging dialogue, but we're killing it, and because we believe that we want to encourage people to value their future perspective better. Speakers for questions. Okay, yeah,
who is consistent with rights on a principal level, second, who best maximizes utility, and third, who encourages the best discussion. But before that, on clarification, I'd like to reiterate a point made by our second speaker, that our principled arguments stand regardless of the type of suicide, because it's still a matter of choice, it's still a matter of an individual's personal autonomous decision. This is also not a contradiction, because we believe that rational actors can still be in pain regardless of the scenario. So now let's get into the heart of the matter and go over the three main areas of clash. First, who is best consistent with rights? We believe that that goes to Team USA. Remember our analysis in our first substantive argument about why the same way we glorify and respect firefighters and soldiers is because we respect those individuals' decisions. We still respect their rights to choice, and we should still respect the choices made by individuals who are contemplating life or death. Let's deepen the analysis about converse rights right now. We tell you that rights have converses. The right to life also implies the right to death. Because if you limit the right to life, you are essentially avoiding other rights and you're harming the ability for individuals to control how they want to pursue their life and have meaning. Our argument is that you should be able to choose, you should be able to decide, and you should be able to have the decision-making capacity to live your life to your fullness. Remember the next layer of analysis that was essentially dropped by Cyromania regarding dignity. What we tell you, that it's not just life and just making sure people have life. It's about what makes life meaningful. What we tell you is that when people have a right to die, they can choose how they want to die. They can choose the instances of their death. They can choose who's around them. They can choose how they want to be remembered as. If they want to be remembered in a positive light, if they don't want to be remembered having Alzheimer's disease and essentially losing part of their identity. This is a very important argument on our side of the house because it links to our burden analysis about why this means the right to choose is so important. If people choose their dignity and choose their identity, they should be able to choose their life. Their only, now let's go over some responses. They tell you that this choice is coercive, but we tell you that it's a rational choice in our framing analysis. We tell you that you can still, you can still fight this analysis because we're not discouraging it. We're instead opening up dialogue. And furthermore, what we tell you is that it's a contradiction on their side of the house to say that it's coercive because at the same time they're saying the government should be the actor to limit these sorts of rights. So that is a contradiction on their side of the house. Next, they tell you. Uh, next is what the, what they tell you is that people are irrational. No, no. But we tell you that people can have counseling. We tell you that people can still talk about it. In fact, we tell you that we encourage discussions on our side of the house. We tell you the only reason they're making the decision is because they are in pain. Their next argument is that it's irreversible, but what we tell you is that people know that suicide is irreversible, so they will take this into consideration when they're making their no. decision. Yes. We are not saying that people should not die. What we're saying is that the state should not give the choice of individuals to die. Of course that people can die if they are to die. Sure. Our argument is that we should still recognize that this is an important right. All of our benefits are about why choice is uniquely important. In fact, we actually say that you haven't proven that the state should limit this right because of our converse rights analysis about why the right to life implies the right to death as well. So now let's go into the second area of clash regarding who maximizes utility. Again, we tell you that that is Team USA. Let's consider why people make the decisions of the right to life or the right to death. We tell you that people could be suffering. We tell you that when people are old, they might have sepsis, waste matter in their, uh, in their body. They might have organ failure. They may have individual suffering as a reason that leads them to determine this right. Furthermore, we tell you that there are familial reasons as well. Individuals have the right not to put their family through suffering, not to allow their family to look at them while they are dying. This is an individual right that helps them the most. What the second speaker brought up was this new argument about maximizing utility. But what we tell you is that a state isn't a person. A state doesn't recognize the agony that individuals face. The state doesn't have the consciousness that the individual has regarding making the decision in the first place. Furthermore, they say that the state has given you countless services, but we say that that is worse. They are literally saying that you that the state owns you because they've helped you in some way. That is not a reason why the state should have this ability to curtail some of your rights. 
In their world, people have no choice. What we tell you is that people can learn the consequences of their, of their action, understand what it applies, and we can give them sorts of outs as well. But we should not let the uh, we should not let the state curtail the suffering of individuals. So now, let's go on to the third and final area of clash regarding who encourages the best discussion. Once again, that is Team USA. This is the new analysis that our second speaker brought up in his last speech. What we tell you is that conversations about death stop before they even start. Because people already have this predisposition that suicide is completely wrong. Let's not understand what you are going through. What we tell you is that in a world where the state doesn't support the right to death, it discourages people from having discussions. What we tell you is that when we recognize the right to die, we recognize the reasons that people have going into death. We can have honest conversations about what it is. Furthermore, what we tell you is that it changes the nature of how we think about death in the first place. We say that people are afraid to talk about it right now because they have a vague concept about what death is and what the implications behind it are. But what we say is that when the state actually supports this right to death, we help people come out about it. They can discuss it with their individuals and we have a culture of acceptance regarding that this is a valid possibility, now let's discuss it. No response to that. But the only other thing that they may have mentioned tangentially was that freedom of speech could still exist. But what we tell you is that the discussion is already closed. What we tell you is that the only way to open up a culture of acceptance is in a world in which we recognize that this is a legitimate choice. This also links to our burden analysis because we tell you that in a world where we can make better decisions, we have a system that supports us, which enables us to make more choice. So at the end of this debate, we stand for the right to choose. We stand for the right to control your own body and make the autonomous decisions. They have to get up in their next speech and prove to you why the government should curtail that right. We say they absolutely should. opposition to Romania who does not support the right of death. So firstly, let's talk about choices. Because Team USA told us today that you have the right to free speech, that you can always that you can always stop talking and you can always and you can always have uh, have to exercise this kind of right. 
But we told you today that irreversibility is very important in our society. Why? Because you can always start talking after you after you stop that. We believe today that this point is very important in our case and is very important in our society. And Team USA never tackle never uh, never tackle it, uh, tackle like it should. We believe today that the state should not give you the it should not give you the possibility to do something which can affect your entire future because this is what this is what the society wants. The society wants to maximize the possibility and maximize uh, your life. In any in, in any a way that he can, we we believe today that being not being able to come back it is a very important thing. Why? We have thousands of people, we have millions of people in our in our society which tried to do suicide, but after they did not they did not kill themselves. After they rehabilitated themselves, they do believe that that was a bad decision. They did rehabilitate themselves, and they did consider that wasn't a bad decision. And we are glad, and we are glad that this uh, this actually happened. Moreover, they gave us the example with the firefighters that they are called heroes. But we are telling you that firefighters should not be included in this discussion. Why? Because they are giving back something to the society. In the moment that you are choosing to kill yourself, you are not contributing to the society. And we believe that we should never support a right that does not maximize the potential for all of us to grow. Moreover, let's talk about pain, because this is a major, a major, uh, major point in our discussion. He told you that when you are suffering for, from massive pain, when you are having cancer, when you are having Alzheimer, this thing should allow you to actually kill yourself. But we believe that mental pain is important. We have a Team USA telling us that no, 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 when you are crazy, when you are being considered mental ill, you cannot kill yourself. Well, we tried to invite them to answer to this question, but they never did. We don't see any difference between mental pain and physical pain, and you should not have this choice because this choice will represent you your whole life, or not in this case. Moreover, we believe today that you are not rational when you are in pain. Pain. Even if you do not suffer from a mental disorder, you are not rational because you suffer, because you see no future or better. And we believe that you can have a future perspective if you let the state to maximize your potential. Moreover, we believe moreover, we told you about rights and the duty of the state, and this is the third point. What we told you basically today in our first speech is that it isn't the duty of the state to maximize your potential to better your life, like uh, like like the team. But they continued to say that no, 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 the state is coercing you. The state is coercing you because you own something to the state. We never said that. We said that we said that you own something to the society. Why? Because you actually sorry. You actually bring a benefit when you are alive. You have the potential to uh, you have the potential to give help to society in order in order in order to develop. And moreover, we we, we moreover we we believe today that in this point we have to tackle the example of slavery. No, thank you. When we are talking about slavery, we see how we do not let people to exercise this kind of right because we give them the right to life. We give them the right to not be used by other person or by yourself in this case. This is why we are not letting you to be a slave because this will actually this will actually will cancel your right to life and we believe that this kind of contradiction should not appear appear in our in our society. Point. Yes. You argue that because these individuals are in pain, they can't make this decision. We say that's exactly why they should make this decision, because they're the only ones that know what they're experiencing. Yes, sir, but you are referring to physical pain. You told us today that if you have a mental disorder, if you feel mental pain, you should not be able to make this decision, and we see this contradiction in your case to be crucial for you to lose. Moreover, we have to talk about the false health that they want to give to these people. They told us today that they will prevent suicide, that they will have discussion, discussion in their society. No, you are not forcing people, you are not forcing people to talk about the problems when you make this a right. Because they will still consider that you are not doing the right thing. Nobody will listen to you. And Alice gave you the example.
example, with having the right to have a religion, to have the to have the right to have your own religion, and if and if, uh, and if in the society nobody wants to talk, talk about your problem with your, your religion, they will not talk, and this is the end of discussion. Yes, ma'am. Why should we only value people for how they contribute to society instead of the individual choices that they make, madam? We agree with you that the individual to individual choices should be important, but we are considering today that you are not making a choice when you are irrational, you are not making your own choice when you are when you are mental, when you are in mental and physical pain. Moreover, let's talk about what the third speaker told us today. They told us that they told she told us today that rights have converses. But we are telling you today that we are not actually we are not actually considering that you should never die. Yes. You have the option to die, but you are, we are not making it a right because the state should not send should not send the message that yes, we will have the context in which you should have this option. No, you should have this option as an individual, but we are not supporting you because the state should support you to maximize your potential in your whole life. Moreover, she told moreover she told us about that you have no utility when you are old. Yes, but you have emotional utility. You have emotional utility for your family. You have emotional ut utility for your grandchildren and so on and so forth. And you as an individual should think about this when you are in mental, mental or physical pain and you are irrational. And moreover, we believe today that the state doesn't own you. But society as a whole should should have uh, should have the uh, should have the power to contribute to development, and you as an individual should contribute to development in any way you can. Thank you, and please do not. yourself, you will be seen as an aggressor. And we believe that when we put 
people that hold another belief that the rights that we establish as a state, and we put them immediately in the position of aggressor, we're not enhancing the possibility of people to enrich freedom of speech. Because we're not respecting their fundamental rights, right? To express freely, to have an interaction, uh, an interaction regarding their beliefs that they believe in. We believe that we're just transforming it in aggressors, and we're taking the easiest way out. This is not how it goes to work. Next point about the right to choice, then let's see how the right to choice really works. As we've told you throughout all our speeches, we do not keep the possibility of people to sell their rights or to put themselves into the position in which you cannot control the end goal of a right that we have given. We don't admit for people to be put into slavery because we cannot control the implication of that act, because it is, uh, we cannot control the reasoning behind the implication of putting yourself into slavery. Into, into slavery, and we don't have a criteria in order to set when this right is being is uh, is being taken away from you, or wait, uh, when you have you haven't taken a rational decision before taking this choice. And at the, uh, talking about rational and irrational decision, we've never understand from the USA the real difference between physical and mental pain. Sure, under their best case scenario, when you put them for people in order to be <coughs> counseled by somebody, first of all they would change their mind and not try to suicide. So this is. In, to some extent, taking away some part of their right to do something. And then in the other scenario, we think that in most of the cases, when it comes to a very, very powerful mental illness, it cannot be solved by any other external factors. We don't understand from Team USA till the end of this debate why specifically, when you are in physical pain and you are unable to make a free decision, it does not take your ration away. It was in their burden to to prove to us how do you quantify ration if you base an entire mechanism of giving the right on the sole word that we consider as being extremely relevant, that being ration. You're not a rational individual if, you, if your emotions are stronger than your cost and benefit analysis. You're not a rational individual if you take a choice under a coercive system. You're not a rational individual if your choice is being influenced by the decision of the ones that stay uh, behind, behind your back. So for all of those reasons, we don't want such relative terms to define such a confidence. that believes that rights are owned by the state and only exist to serve better society in terms of utility. And we have a team proposition that believes that rights belong to people and that the reason you have a right is because you as an individual are valuable and that that necessitates protections by the state. In this speech, I'll be looking at why that principled clash must mean this round goes to the proposition. I'll begin with a couple of clarification issues, then look at who best makes this decision for the individual, and then what the rights of the individual are. But let's begin with some clarification. So the first thing I spend a lot of time on is this distinction between mental pain and physical pain. Our problem isn't with people who are in mental pain. Our problem is with people who are suffering from conditions like schizophrenia, who are not in control of their actions. We think it's pretty easy to tell the difference between someone who's suffering mental anguish because of their position in life and someone who is clinically incapable of making decisions. We exclude one, we include one, we don't see what the tension is that they're so concerned about. Then they keep arguing that we are coercing people into making this decision and coercing doctors into providing it. These arguments about doctors are made only in their third speech. And what we tell you is that if a doctor doesn't want to provide assisted suicide, then they don't have to. That was never in our model anywhere. We don't understand why they're arguing against it. Then what they say is that having this right coerces individuals into making this decision. But they've never given you any analysis how to. The government provides me the right to free speech. They don't force me to speak. Having a right to do something in no way forces you to do it, and we don't see any compelling analysis as to why you should treat it as such. So the first question is who better makes this decision? What they tell you is individuals can't make this decision because they are in pain. What we tell you is that's exactly why they must make that decision. 
Of course the state wouldn't make that decision because the state's not in pain. If you are in anguish and you ask your friend who is not what they would do, of course their answer is different from yours because they're not experiencing what you are experiencing. Does that make you irrational? No. It means that you are responding to the circumstances in which you live. That's what individual decision is all about. What we say is the individual knows what is best for them. The state does not because the state is not experiencing what they were going through. Then what they argue is that this is wrong because it's irreversible. What we tell you is the standard about perfect reversibility is sort of crazy. If I decide what college major to pursue, I close the door on pursuing other things for the rest of my life. Right? This idea that you should at any given time be able to switch between different decisions is an absurd standard for what makes a reasonable choice. We think if individuals have thought this through, if they decided that it's best for them and best for their family, then the state has no right to take that decision away from them because the individual is the only one who can make that decision for themselves because they know what they are experiencing and the state is not. So it is clear that the individual is best equipped to make this decision, not the state. So now let's look at the principle clash on what the rights of an individual are. What we essentially hear from team opposition is that they have no problem with people dying, people like firefighters and soldiers. They just want their deaths to be useful to the state. They say, sure, the firefighter can die because they're being useful. But if you take your life to save your family from anguish, well, sorry, you're not helping out society enough, so we don't respect your rights. The state does not own you. Society does not own you because they educated you. Society does not own you because you own owe a debt. Essentially what they say is, under their logic, the state would force all of us to work 80-hour work weeks because that would maximize our potential for the state. We say no. Rights do not belong to the state. Rights belong to the individual. That's what makes them rights. And we fundamentally believe that when you have the right to control your life, you have the right to decide what is best for you, that must mean you have the right to continue not to live. If they are so concerned about coercion, then do not allow the state to force people to live when they wish to take their life. Do not make the state force people to lose their identity to Alzheimer's while their family suffers that transition. We believe in the individual, we believe in choice, and we believe in dignity, and that is why we propose. <laughs> Now over, the adjudicators will deliberate the course now. We request the teams and the